Hey, I'm Nathan Carlson. I'm a doctor of physical therapy and I run a running specific practice in Kansas City. And today we're gonna go through the five questions that you need to ask after you're diagnosed with a bone stress injury. First thing you wanna figure out is what bone is involved. Different bones have different jobs. That's why your rib cage looks different than your tibia. You wanna understand the specific bone that's involved because different bones are managed differently. You have two types of bone tissue in your body, cortical bone and spongy bone. The bones in your body are made up of different percentages of these two types. Cortical bone is strong stronger, stiffer, and better able to deal with stress. As we get more distal in our body, your bones become more cortical in nature. As we get more central in our body, think your sacrum, your lumbar spine, and your pelvis, the bones become more spongy, and spongier bones are often affected to a greater degree by underfueling and alterations in hormone function. If a runner comes in and they're diagnosed with an injury in their sacrum or their pelvis, I'm more concerned that there are other factors that we need to address during the rehab, and we're gonna need to refer them to a dietitian. Second question, what is the specific location within that bone? Your tibia is the most common location for a bone stress injury, but you can have different locations within that tibia that are managed in different ways. This is because we categorize bone stress injuries into low and high risk based off of their potential to heal and the likelihood that they're gonna have complications. Low risk locations tend to heal really well, they have good blood flow and favorable biomechanics. High risk locations tend to have a harder time healing and are more likely to progress to a full fracture, potentially need a surgical intervention, or have a higher risk of not healing or developing avascular necrosis. All this really means is that you need to know the bone that's involved, but you also have to know the specific location within that bone because they could change how you're gonna manage it. Your third question is what is the grade on imaging? Most bone stress injuries are diagnosed via an MRI. It's our best test for trying to figure out if that's what you're dealing with. When an MRI is performed, we grade bone stress injuries depending on the image that we see. A grade one, grade two, or grade three injury is a stress reaction, meaning that we only see swelling, while a grade four injury is when we start to see a fracture line. Stress reactions are grade one, two, three, grade four is that stress fracture. This is important for a couple different reasons. A lot of times people will use the terms reaction and fracture interchangeably. That's not the best way to use them. We see this by this paper by Warden and colleagues. A runner that has a grade one injury is going to be managed differently than a runner that has a grade four injury. Know the bone, know the location, know the grade on imaging. And as a side note, radiology reports don't always show these. So if you don't have that on your imaging, ask your physician to reread it or reach out to the radiologist. Fourth question, what can I do right now? We just covered how there's low and high risk locations and these locations are managed very differently. If you're dealing with a low risk location, there's a likely chance you can continue to do something. If you don't have pain with walking or riding a bike or moving around, you probably don't need to be in a boot or on crutches. But if you've been diagnosed with a high risk injury, you likely have to be non-weight bearing for four to six weeks, depending on the location. This is because those high risk locations have a higher likelihood of worse outcomes. As a helpful reference, this table from Kahanov and colleagues goes through the typical time to return to weight bearing depending on different locations. And all the tables and graphics that I show you, you can find the references in the description below. All right, the most important question and the one that I get asked first when I'm dealing with a patient, when can I run? When a runner can't run, the only thing they can think about is when they can run. And that's a great question to ask after diagnosis. There's a lot of variables to consider when determining when that specific launch date is going to happen, but Again, we do have some data that can give us a general timeline. These tables highlight typical return to run guidelines depending on the grade of injury and the specific location. These numbers are often pulled from military studies or collegiate runners, which is likely a different situation than the patient that you're working with, but it gives us the timeline. Once you have that information, you're in such a better position to figure out how to manage someone's rehab. And then you wanna to start to investigate what does running actually look like them? What is the expectation for how often they're gonna run, how far they're gonna run, how fast they're gonna run? Are they getting back to racing? Do they do a lot of their running on trails? And trying to get a sense for what running looks like in their unique life so you can design a rehab plan that reflects that. 